Well, everyone, welcome. We are so grateful to have you with us for today's webinar, Confidential Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Advocacy Plus Child Abuse Intervention in Partnership. There is a lot to this topic, and today we want to really focus on how these efforts complement one another and when combined, enhance the safety and wellness for youth in all of our communities. And we recognize that the roles that you all play in these conversations and support. So thank you for that. All right. Uh, we want to offer this brief disclaimer that the information in this webinar is not offered as legal advice and is provided for informational purposes only. And as well, um, practices and responses will vary in each of Oregon's counties too. So always make sure to refer back to the space that you live and work. Briefly about today's webinar, uh, closed captioning is available and can be found at the bottom of your screen in the toolbar. And you should also have received a PDF copy of the slides we will be using today. And please utilize those during or after today's presentation in case we move through a slide that you wanted to spend more time on. And this PDF version will also be compatible with screen readers. Also want to name huge appreciation for our interpreters today. Thank you so much for being here with us. And there will also be time today where I'm not able to access the chat box. And so for any tech issues that may show up or anything that uh, you're experiencing during the webinar, please direct chat Oregon SATF's prevention coordinator, Meg Foster. And Meg, thank you for being our tech magician today. Um, and we, are, <laughs> we are also excited um, that we have so many people joining us today and that we have a lot that we are gonna cover. And so with that in mind, we're asking that you put questions in the chat box today and we'll try our best to get to them all, but if not, we will follow up afterwards. And of course, a huge reminder to please just take breaks, move, eat, rest, dance, or anything else that you may need to support your wellness at any time. And we will also be taking a five minute break around the halfway point at 11 o'clock. And then finally, I just wanna highlight that with today's conversation that it is just a small piece of the overall puzzle and that there are so many considerations, conversations, communities, youth voices, and partners with great expertise around the state that are crucial for these conversations. And we also, again, are grateful for those of you in the space with us today who also bring so much of that knowledge and that there are going to be many conversations and work that is continuing alongside and after this webinar. Also wanna throw out a one more shout out for next week's webinar, which is the second one in this series. Um, that is gonna be mandatory reporting plus confidential advocacy partnerships in youth serving settings. That's next Wednesday. So if you are able to join us for that, we'd love to see you there. And we still have some room open in our registration. And as well, another resource that complements today's webinar is the release of the Mandatory Reporting and Confidential Advocacy Partnership Guide, which just uh, came out a few days ago. That should, you should also have a link in your email as well, and Meg is gonna be dropping one in the chat. Thanks again, Meg. Um, and this guide has got a ton of information, and I mean a ton in the best way possible, where it is the best of things. So you can just jump around to anything that may be coming up for you, a space that you need or want more information on. And a lot of what we don't get to today, there can be so much more that is found in this uh, in this uh, partnership guide. And we hope that you will share it with others who may be interested and uh, refer back to it yourself when needed. And of course, we have to name that uh, huge special thank you to so many of the partners that are on the screen. And of course, there's more um, that aren't on the screen as well and people who have informed the resources that we are releasing this month, as well as the conversations that we are having today. Um, so again, without this uh, support, feedback, time, and effort um, from so many people around the state, um, these conversations would be severely lacking. So thank you all again for that. And on that topic of partners and people who are informing the work, we want to take a moment here to get to introduce some of our panelists and uh, speakers today. And I'll start in with, uh, my name is Eli Cox and I use he and pronouns, and I'm the Abuse Prevention Coordinator with the Oregon Sexual Assault Task Force. 
So we are a nonprofit that seeks to connect multidisciplinary partners and efforts in order to improve the prevention of and the response to sexual violence around the state of Oregon. Uh, for myself, I grew up in rural Oregon and I spent the majority of my life living and working there. Um, as well, some of the jobs I've gotten to work in and have roles in have been in uh, a domestic violence sexual assault agency in the prevention department and also at a child advocacy center in the prevention department for multiple years. Um, and really this webinar and this conversation today is kind of a dream come true for getting to have these key conversations um, when we know that there's so much overlap in these roles. Um, and uh, this is really dear for me also because I've gotten to work with and learn from so many young people around the state who have been through and experienced and wanted um, aspects of each of the services that we're going to talk about today. Um, and with that, uh, Lindsay, I will pass it to you next. Awesome. Thanks, Eli. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Lindsay Spaulding. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the Prevention Health Coordinator at CARES Northwest, which is uh, the local children's advocacy center for Multnomah County and Washington County. Um, and a little bit about me. Uh, previous to working at CARES, I've been there for about a year now. Uh, previous to that, I worked in domestic violence and sexual violence field for about seven years, uh, both in uh, Oregon and outside of it. Um, so while I was here in Oregon, I worked at the uh, Sexual Assault Resource Center in Washington County, if you're familiar with them, specifically focused on response and prevention around sexual violence, which is really unique. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'll pass it over to Sarah. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, my name is Sarah Wickersham. I'm the executive director of Douglas Cares, which is the local child advocacy center in Douglas County. Uh, our main office is located in Roseburg, but we have satellite offices at, at different points throughout the county. Um, a little bit about me is um, I'm a survivor. I, I have lived experience in um, in most of the, of the challenges that the clients who come through our door face and the clients who come through um, our DVSA partners doors. Um, but also I've been in um, the field of caring for children and families for uh, almost 20 years now. And, um, and really, really feel strongly about uh, the mission of D Douglas Cares, of child advocacy in general, of DVSAs, and of this partnership where we can um, come into a family during, during their challenges and struggles and help lift them up and up um, and build them up to a point where they can be a safe, healthy place for everyone in the family to grow. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Erin. Hi, thank you. I'm Erin Ritchie, she, her pronouns, and I'm the Student Outreach and Advocacy Coordinator for Peace at Home Advocacy Center, which is the local domestic violence sexual assault agency in Douglas County, so in the same area, um, also located in Roseburg. I spend my time working with students in um, middle schools and high schools, providing healthy relationship education, and about half of my time on our local community college campus, providing services and education here as well. Um, and so I'm really grateful to be here. I've been at, at Peace at Home for a little over three years now. And before that, I did other campus-based advocacy as student and things like that. So. I'm excited to be here and I will pass it back to Eli. Who is now off mute. Awesome. Thanks so much, Aaron, Sarah, and Lindsay for your time and for being here with us today and all that you put into these conversations. And really excited, uh, especially as we think about today's goals and some of the conversations that we're going to have, uh, just the topics that we're going to get to dive into. And so uh, with a lot of appreciation for the Anti-Oppression Resource and Training Alliance, also known as AORTA here in Oregon. Um, they've kind of had this cool framework for some slides that we really like, so we're borrowing with appreciation for them. But we wanted to set around a few of our goals for what we will do, what we might do today, and what we won't do. Um, especially recognizing that we have uh, only so much time and there is so much to talk about on this topic. Uh, so what we won't do today is that uh, we will not be doing a deep dive into the nuance and complexities of mandatory reporting and confidential advocacy laws. But if you are really wanting that, um, you can find that in the partnership guide that has been dropped in the chat box. And then uh, we also won't have time today to troubleshoot individual partnerships in your communities, but we are really open and invite connection outside of this webinar. So please reach out afterwards if that's something you would like to do. 
Uh, something we might do today, if we have time, is think through a little bit more some of our general partnership barriers that have arisen in efforts to better serve youth in our communities. And then we will for sure be examining shared goals and overlaps between all of our efforts that highlight why partnering benefits youth safety and explore models of how these partnerships can take shape along with some of the strategies that promote collaboration in our communities too. And so as we set a little bit of foundation with today's topic and recognize that on in, in the audience, we have people from so many uh, varied lenses, perspectives, and disciplines, uh, which really makes for rich discussion and conversation and is the key uh, in all of our efforts to having enhanced and increased outcomes. We want to take a moment to just go over um, some of the pieces that we are going to be talking about today um, to set us up for the rest of our conversations. Um, and with that, we want to start off with a couple polls. So Lindsay, I will pass it over to you here. Yeah, for sure. So um, I think uh, it would be a miss uh, to not ask you all what your role is, uh, where you're coming from, given that we're talking about collaboration from uh, two different response and prevention systems that have historically kind of been separated. Uh, so we want to know uh, the focus of your role, and we're going to ask you in two different ways. Uh, there's two different questions in this poll, um, and I believe it is going to be launched soon. <laughs> okay, great. So we'll take some time for folks to fill that out real quick. And Lindsay, the polls are mm -hmm. set up as two separate polls. So we'll have to do the first one and then the second one, just FYI. Perfect. That makes it easier. One question at a time. Uh, yeah, so we'll start with this first one. I think this is how we traditionally um, understand the focus of our role when we're talking with community partners that work in different forms of violence. We're like, who's taking what form of violence, right? Uh, some of us may find this uh, question really easy and some of us may find it tricky, especially as those forms of violence overlap. So we'll get to that in just a second. About 75% of folks have responded. Kind of leveling off over here. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, oh, oh. A little surge there. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and um, end the poll. Sorry if your answer didn't get in, but I wanna share those results with you and then jump into that second one. Awesome. So uh, hopefully you can see the results, uh, but we're kind of mixed, which is really cool. I didn't know if we would have more representation from some groups than others, but I love how this is like kind of all over the place and or we've got more folks that are doing multiple forms of violence and they identify it as such. So that's fantastic uh, to see that that's happening. We still have uh, a majority of child abuse folks here, which is so awesome. Um, I'm happy about that personally, coming from the child abuse world, uh, that more folks uh, are here for that. Um, but I love how we've got folks all over the place um, with trafficking being our smallest, which also begs the question of like, how do we bring those folks into this conversation, uh, given that they weren't explicitly named even in the title, right? Um, and of course, there are so many other forms of trauma and harm that we could encompass. So I love that folks are identifying they work with other forms of trauma. So that's great. Um, so we're gonna go and compare this to a separate poll, a second question. I wanna know what the focus of your role is. Um, and again, these are multiple choice, so you can just select multiple. Um, this one may take us a little bit more time. I appreciate the options in the second piece, right? Because I think so often like we experience our role or our title may be one thing. And when we talk to someone in public, it's like, and I do like 10 or 15 different things that result in what that really means, right? There's so many different ways. So I like the chance to get to explore a little bit deeper into what we're actually doing. Right. And I would imagine that we're going to have probably some some over, more overlap here. This is where we're gonna find like where we can collaborate. And so it'll be really interesting to see what most folks are identifying as the focus of their role and how maybe we can, instead of uh, coming at it from, I'm from this field, I'm from that field, uh, we're partnering on the function of our role, which is either to support children and teens after violence has happened or supporting adults after violence has happened, right? Um, many folks from all forms of violence, uh, intervention and prevention are doing a lot of these things. So 
And I love uh, already, I'll just tell folks a little bit. I see some good education and prevention numbers, which I'm happy about as well. I'm biased towards that. All right. Um, there we go. Results are shared. Hopefully you can see them. Um, so it looks like a majority of the folks here are uh, focusing on supporting children and teens after violence has happened and also supporting adults after violence has happened. And a lot of you are connecting survivors of violence with resources and referrals. So that's really cool. Uh, and safety planning. Um, we do have, again, 49% uh, doing education um, and prevention. And then we have some folks that are uh, specifically focused on justice and accountability and facilitating reports and investigations, uh, right? A, a different role maybe than uh, the advocacy piece, but still uh, very important. Um, so, uh, and I love always shouting out the people who are supporting those who are serving survivors of violence. Y'all are doing work um, and supporting us and, and holding us down, <laughs> whatever that looks like. Uh, management, administrators, all of you. So, fantastic. Um, thank you all for taking these polls. And hopefully um, this gets us started on our, our foundation of what could our role look like when we share common language and we find the common language between the work that we're doing. So getting us started with that. I'll send it back to you, Eli. Hey, thanks so much, Lindsay. And, and I will briefly share, uh, Lindsay came up with these shared goals and we had talked about them with all of us as presenters too. Um, but just that brief, uh, you know, getting to follow up on that, right? All of these shared spaces and why we come to the work and why we do what we do, right? Uh, especially when we think about all kids and adults having access to safety, filling the gaps in our current system that is responding to violence, and then serving our communities in the best way possible, which means connecting with other service providers through our differences. Um, because, and, there, and again, we know that there can be so many more, you know, shared goals and they could get really expansive and we could write books on it, which is amazing. Um, but for this purpose of today, keeping it back to these, you know, three very simple ones that we can return back to in any moments um, as we're, you know, uh, experience, as we're like having conversations and knowing that we're coming from different lenses and perspectives, we can also know that everyone on this like call in general, we are going to have these shared goals. Because why that's important is that we know that young people in Oregon are experiencing multiple forms of violence and abuse um, that are overlapping, right? Their lived experience is complicated and complex and requires adaptable resource responses and options. Um, and these forms of violence, since they are overlapping and connected, requires us as responders, as people working in the field, to figure out where we can line up in all of our um, overlaps. That way we're the most efficient when it comes to meeting the needs of survivors and victims. And you can see, again, this is on the slide, having this timeline of age, you know, zero, you know, going upwards and just seeing some of the examples of harms and violence that, you know, people and especially youth can be experiencing at multiple times in their lives. And so we know that the reality for a person uh, may look um, like multiple forms of harm. And so that it's dependent upon us as providers, as responders, as people in the work um, to also figure out how we are overlapping. Because the reality is that the systems we utilize to respond to violence are really complex. Um, and especially when we're thinking of all the varying roles and stakeholders that are in these efforts and responses, each one is so intricate and has their own pieces that are especially um, lined up to support youth or to support people that have experienced violence or no harm. But one of the spaces, uh, and again, so naming that it's like confusing at times for us that are working in the field, but also, you know, can be additionally a layer of confusion for people who have experienced that harm and violence between these systems and settings. Um, so again, this chart is not meant on this uh, page is not meant to be like, aha, I feel reassured by the easy flow of how everything works. But what this does do is show some of that intricacy. And then also um, it can highlight too with the confidential options on that left side, the ability um, that advocates can have, um, especially in partnership, um, that role for helping people navigate these systems and supports available to them and understanding what may be happening at any given part of the process um, with all the different engaged stakeholders. 
Um, and especially for this conversations today, uh, it's really worth naming all of our efforts in general are complementary, right? Like nothing is in opposition to one another. We're coming from those shared goals. And what we're doing is to try and make it so that we can best support the people we work with. And uh, just doing a quick note here on this section in terms of some of the language for mandatory reporters of child abuse, um, in terms when someone um, who has you know, people who need to make a mandatory report to either the Oregon Child Abuse Hotline or law enforcement, ideally in a trauma-informed ways that give the victim and survivor as much voice as possible. Um, and then also for privileged and confidential advocates uh, that we're talking about today, uh, these advocates uh, that we're thinking about work through qualifying domestic and sexual violence agencies and programs throughout Oregon. Um, and these people may also include uh, folks from organizations who provide prevention programming, um, including prevention education, and that may be part of their role also. Uh, for a little more information on these specific spaces, uh, you can check out page 20 in the partnership guide uh, for a little deep dive, especially between the difference for privilege and confidential advocates. Um, and in general, uh, we're just recognizing for confidential advocates, we'll kind of be using that term today, um, recognizing how important like that access for survivors to confidentiality ends up being a critical piece in ensuring safety for survivors um, as an extra protection against them, fearing that you know what they say will be used against them or potentially could open them up to further harm by the person um, that may be hurting them. And also want to name that there are so many advocates um, in so many ways in the state of Oregon, which is a really amazing thing and really important when it comes to um, each person needing a slightly different resource or support in different ways, right? And meeting that in a different area. But uh, for the purpose of today's conversations, when we're thinking of the word advocate, we're thinking about that highlighted uh, highlighted words there up at the top around uh, providing privilege and confidential advocacy from community-based domestic and sexual violence organizations. So with a little bit of that foundation, and again, want to name that's really brief, we want to think about now the overlaps in our efforts and why partnering is important. So I'll pass it on to Lindsay here in the best tree picture in the world. You know, I would like to claim that I found it myself, but you know, I think it was just uh, something on the internet. So um, <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, so uh, when we talk about prevention uh, of violence, we often like to talk about how we can't just start with the violence that happened. We need to look past it and be able to see what led to this violence happening? What were those root causes um, that caused that person to make that choice um, that led them to that situation? Um, similarly, I mean, I think we can do this with a lot of things in life. Uh, look uh, kind of backward to see how did we get here? And I wanna kind of do that same thing, which is why I've got this tree with the roots. Um, we have the systems that we have and the responses that we have because of some historical roots. And I won't dive too uh, deeply into those historical roots, but I think it's worth naming a little bit and maybe analyzing and thinking more about uh, together. So um, here we go, I'm gonna attempt to do it myself. We'll see if I can. There we go. Um, <laughs> so uh, again, I've got a brief and incomplete history. So please, I know that if I'm leaving out key things that you're like, I can't believe Lindsay forgot this. This is so important to our movement and you forgot it. I understand. I get it. <laughs> um, I probably did do that. Uh, I had to narrow it down to like four bullet points to make sure it fits into the slide really well. Um, but I do think looking at these key points can be really uh, interesting to see how both of these responses kind of were formed um, in our country, at least here in America. So I did not think larger scope past that. Um, so on the child abuse response side, um, uh, folks may know a little bit about the history of how those responses were formed. Um, previous to 1985, so you're looking at the 1980s and, and further back, um, there were law enforcement um, and medical institutions that were trying to address uh, child abuse and child welfare um, slowly but surely, especially um, after some key research came out that Eli will talk about um, here in just a little bit. Um, 
that need that um, need for response really rose um, for a period of time. But what they found was that they were struggling to coordinate with one another. Um, and so in 1985, the first Children's Advocacy Center was created in Alabama alongside the idea and the model of a multidisciplinary team. So many of us may be familiar with that, but that really brings all of these partners, um, including Children's Advocacy Centers, law enforcement, child welfare, and DHS um, into the same uh, team together to work on cases uh, and to staff these to the best of their ability. Um, in Oregon, specifically, legislation for the creation of uh, an MDT, a multidisciplinary team, in every county passed in 1989. So we all, in every single county, have to have this kind of team. Um, and of course, their strategies and the way that they function will vary across different counties. So that's something to note as well. Um, today, in Oregon, there are about 24 CACs that serve around 8,000 children and teens every year. Um, I think it's really important to mention that that's just the children and teens that they serve. We know that they often serve whole families, right, in providing response, and those are not necessarily captured in this number. On the domestic violence and sexual violence response side, I think um, some of us may be familiar with this history as well. Um, law enforcement were often called to respond to domestic and sexual violence uh, matters, which uh, for the longest time were seen as a personal matter. There's a lot of stigma around that. Um, and then about in the 1970s, we saw a uh, second wave feminist activism really activate around this issue of violence and start forming advocacy responses to domestic and sexual violence across the United States. So some formed as crisis lines specifically, uh, some really focused on awareness and take back the night events, right? Um, but that feminist activism really started the advocacy responses and those grew into uh, whole organizations that then just determined to work and respond to domestic violence and sexual violence. Um, in 1994, something big happened. Uh, the Violence Against Women Act passed for the first time in Congress, and it had an emphasis on coordinating response. So working more with law enforcement and other institutions uh, to see that survivors are getting uh, justice and accountability as well as support. Uh, in one year in Oregon, uh, domestic violence and sexual violence organizations served around 118,248 people of uh, various ages. Um, so in this annual report that they've collected, they have folks uh, they've, uh, that they've served that are young children um, and older. Um, so they cover the whole thing in this number. Uh, so again, that's to differentiate those two numbers you see at the bottom. Uh, we may not have those full uh, numbers be compar co quite comparable, but uh, that was the closest we could find. Um, still quite a number of people in our state served. So with, again, this brief and very incomplete history, I want to ask in the chat, because I'm, I'm going to try and get us interactive a little bit, um, what are some similarities or differences that you notice in our movements that have led us to where we are today? Feel free to take a second and type something into the chat. And I'm realizing, okay, here we go. There's the chat. Sometimes Eli, when you shared the screen, I was like, oh no, will I be able to see it? Thank you, Kristen, for stepping up, being our first person in the chat. Uh, the difference between like privilege and confidentiality possibly and that mandatory reporting is the thing that most people notice for sure. Uh, okay. Yeah. Say oh, the question oh. one more time, just for I folks. Totally I'll get it typed in the chat box. Thanks, Meg. Um, yeah, so the question is what similarities and differences do you notice between these histories? Um, Claire, you mentioned the importance of collaboration between stakeholders was um, key in, in both responses or was at least brought up um, and, and talked about maybe at different times in both histories for sure. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Roots and origins of our, our movements. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to know where they came from. I think one thing that does always stand out to me is that um, before these movements really came into play, um, we didn't have a, a very strategic response to any of these forms of violence. And that overall, um, these years are very relatively recent um, overall. Um, some of us, you know, not me personally, but have lived through those times, right? So it's not that um, uh, long ago. And I think we need to keep that in mind for sure. 
Uh, Vicky, thank you. Uh, differences. Yeah, this uh, hostility possibly between advocates and slash service providers and those involved with the criminal justice system. Yeah, both histories have a little bit of tension in navigating that criminal justice system. It can be really difficult. Um, and both have uh, then decided to do different things uh, through in that partnership. Um, similarities siloing both have that in common both think i gotta take on this problem nobody else is doing this work i'm gonna take it all on put it on my shoulders yeah for sure uh, sierra more uh, initial law enforcement involvement with children compared to like the the more personal perspective of violence against women yeah maybe uh seeing that this uh the response to child abuse is almost initially uh completely coordinated with systems whereas um we do see a lot more uh, of the history and advocacy with domestic violence and sexual violence to be, you know, personal. Um, we're going to deal with this individual's problems, um, not necessarily on a system level. Um, yes, Rachel, yes, there's plenty of legislation involvement. And in fact, Eli is going to get to that in just a second in both movements. They have that. Um, and differences being systems versus individuals who were oppressed, collaborated, that created the movements. Yes. Um, talking about how oppression factors into these conversations, like uh, seeing how uh, children being not seen as children, but instead as many adults through time, um, were instead, uh, you know, not getting the response that they needed when they experienced abuse, for sure. And of course, uh, feminist movement really pushing that along. All right. Thank you for all your responses. I see more. I got to get moving because uh, I only got so much time. Uh, so we're going to keep going here and I'm going to hope that I still have control and can move it along. Great. Go for it, Eli. Possibly. Okay, I finally got my mouse to go up to the uh, the mute button. Sorry about that all. Uh, so yeah, and I'm, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because, uh, yeah, in terms of how much we want to get into today, uh, you can find uh, this brief timeline here on page 10 in the partnership guide, uh, which dives in uh, in more in depth to each of these kind of passages of law and moments. But yeah, just uh, briefly, like Lindsay had mentioned, you know, we see in 1963 when uh, public consciousness like finally starts formulating around like child abuse and definitions in the ways that, you know, it needs to be responded to and creating mandatory reporting. And then also thinking in 1974, the enhancement of who became a mandatory reporter uh, was also built in. Um, and one piece that uh, that led to was uh, some unintended consequences and some rates in, um, that were, you know, not essentially, uh, you know, positive in ways that were detrimental to some of those repercussions uh, that rose because of those requirements. Um, and so then, and then 1974, uh, you see the Violence Against Women Act, also known as VAWA, that came through. And so this uh, was something that also mandated any shelter, rape crisis center, domestic violence program, or other victim service program that received VAWA funding was prohibited from sharing any information about a victim receiving services, including their locational information. Um, and this was done so in an, in an effort to try and keep you know, victims and survivors safe um, and recognizing that tie and pulls that sometimes uh, people who are harming them were using um, against them in that way. Um, and then in 2013, we see that expansion uh, for you know, further for people who are mandatory reporters in Oregon with still maintaining those exceptions um, for confidential advocates. And then in 2015, um, the establishing of certified advocate victim privilege um, here in Oregon uh, was key and crucial as well. And I believe, uh, my knowledge, the only state in the 50 states that has that. Um, we were the first. There have been a couple of other states that have followed, but we were the first. Awesome. Thanks for that clarification. Babe. As we think about, um, wrong way, here we go. As we think about each of these uh, efforts, though, uh, what they do is that they all provide um, safe supports um, to people that we're trying to protect um, and people that are trying uh, to play a role in providing that for youth. Um, so again, uh, these slides that you see here are not exhaustive, and but what mandatory reporters 
do they connect youth with resources and systems that can help them provide trauma-informed reporting processes and are oftentimes the first person um, that a youth has like talked to and has found that you know we'll believe and listen to them and support them, um, as well as connecting youth to other community resources, including confidential advocacy. And that role is integral in the process of people experiencing health, safety, and wellness. And then as well, uh, just quickly for confidential advocates, some of the safe supports they provide include that emotional support, um, confidentiality, safety planning um, for youth, and really giving more information around their rights and helping them to access resources um, that they may need as they're experiencing violence and or harm and trying to, as much as possible, I'll say with both efforts, finding ways where control and power and choice can be returned to victims and really be survivor centered um, and especially uh, with a lot of our the confidential advocates. Oops. All right. So just wanted to restate those goals and we're going to kind of walk through each one because I think these goal, these shared goals of ours uh, really set up our why. Um, so for the first goal, hey, it wants to go. Here we go. I'll, I'll get it. Uh, so the first goal here is like all kids and adults have access to safety. I think we all come from that perspective, right? Um, I have this uh, great graphic um, talking about ACEs, but you can see on the tree, we've got different forms of violence, different forms of trauma that can happen in a person's life. And they have similar roots, right? You can see those below. Um, they have include things like poverty, um, a lot of things regarding oppression, like uh, structural racism, um, lack of capital and mobility, right, these pieces as well. And ever more present, right, is the effect that our environment is having on folks and their uh, opportunities and how it impacts trauma that they're experiencing, right. So um, we are um, similar traumas or traumas that uh, people can carry and do have similar roots. Um, so as much as our uh, different forms of violence have different dynamics, they do have certain things in common as well, right? So we know that um, both uh, domestic violence and sexual violence and child abuse, so all three, um, do have elements of power and control, right? One person is trying to get what they want without asking for consent because they want to, regardless of what somebody else wants. And so that aspect is really similar for all three. Uh, they all involve a lack of consent, either because it just can't be given um, or because uh, that is taken away from somebody or not listened to. All three have a strong root in oppression, right? All, we know many of us, I've heard you all talk about it. It can happen to anybody, but it cannot happen to everyone equally, or it's not happening to everyone equally is what the data is showing us. And the last one I think we all struggle with, which is that um, all of these forms of violence are more common than people in our society or our, our everyday folks walking around um, may believe that it's actually happening, um, especially depending on our communities. Uh, we may have people flat out deny that these things are happening uh, in their community, right? We all struggle with that. Uh, similarly, we have those things in common. And on top of that, when we talk about what is safety, um, you know, I'd love for you all to put in the chat, um, I'm gonna kind of talk about it, but put in the chat, what do you identify as safety? What comes to your mind when you think of safety? And Meg, I'm sure is gonna put the question in the chat, um, but if you wanna type in some chat responses, I'd really love that uh, to see your ideas of what safety means. Um, because today we're kind of using this as a catch-all term for um, so many other things, not just like safety, but also like uh, stability and uh, supportive uh, environments and, and healthy environments, positive environments. Uh, and you all are getting at that with some of your resources, like safe and stable housing. We think of, we think about like reliable resources, but also safety is just sometimes a place to talk to somebody, to disclose what's happening to you. Right, that's often the first step in healing. Um, great, I love this. Uh, protected from harm and danger. So it could be like physical, um, but it also could very much be psychological. Um, I think this uh, defining this word is important because we need to establish that safety can look a lot of different ways. And um, we primarily think of physical safety. A lot of us are focused on someone's physical safety. Um, and uh, there's a lot that can be said about psychological safety um, and the emotional toll that trauma takes. Um, so some of the folks that we work with may be physically safe now, but they are struggling, 
right? They're not um, healthy or, you know, feeling healed in any way, right? Uh, they're struggling. So um, keeping this idea that safety can look a lot of different ways and all of us at the table may be addressing safety in a little bit of a different way, um, right? So our DVSA advocates, um, I know have uh, like 24 hour crisis lines, right? How much are those addressing safety? Sometimes it can be somebody's physical safety and other times it can just be that person that you can go talk to um, when you are activated or struggling, right? Um, so recognizing that that same intention of safety is there um, through all of our work. Um, I do have a note too on development, especially when we talk about kids' safety. I think often the conversation uh, is about how can we establish a child's safety um, kind of almost without involving them. Uh, we tend to sometimes do that as adults. We kind of step in and we say, we know what safety looks like. We're going to provide it to you. Um, and I think it's just important to know um, that even with the different stages of child development, we know that kids are very capable of knowing when they are not feeling safe. They're very capable of knowing when they need help. So um, here I, I've just got that note, right? Children may not recognize certain behaviors as unsafe if the behaviors have been normalized over time, repeatedly, right? We see that with boundary manipulation, aka grooming as folks call it still. Um, teens may be more likely to not consider the way that decisions may impact their safety farther down the road, right? Um, still, even then, right, this does not mean that they're just incapable developmentally of recognizing that feeling of being unsafe, physically or emotionally. Um, they are very able to do that, and many of them are able to ask for help, right? So we need to keep that in mind when we uh, talk about the safety of children and how we can involve them in the process of uh, establishing their safety, right? All right. I'll keep going, hopefully. Um, so moving to that second goal. I think many of us, uh, and I've, I've heard it from you all, we've been in conversations, I see the attendee list, I know of several of you, um, right? We, we know that there are gaps in this uh, current systems of responding, whether it's domestic violence and sexual violence systems or it's uh, child abuse systems, um, or even both of us together. Um, there are gaps, right? Uh, this great quote, I love citing it, it is from Connecting the Dots, um, which is a really great toolkit from the CDC if you haven't heard of this. Um, so I'm going to read this quote out loud. Professionally, we have silos and we operate in these silos we've got to break down. Across the country, people working to prevent child abuse are right across the hall from people working on violence against women, and they don't necessarily work together. Uh, as we go into communities to bring everybody to the table, don't let people say, well, I work on child abuse, but this is about gang violence. Uh, don't let people say, I work on violence against women, and that's about child abuse. Uh, this thing, all of this violence is connected. So um, really good quote to talk about how um, we already know that we are siloing off. And I think many of us are hitting that realization, especially here in Oregon and having those conversations with you all, um, that we're realizing it's that, that siloing is leading to gaps for the folks that we serve, the children and adults that we are trying to serve in our community, right? Um, especially when it comes to um, who folks tell. I think both children and adults uh, don't necessarily speak up when they experience um, any form of violence or trauma. It's very common. I know we talked about it at length, um, but I wanted to spend some specific time talking about children in particular. Um, what we know is generally children uh, do not disclose if they've experienced uh, child abuse, especially child sexual abuse, right? Um, nationally, we see that between different studies, uh, anywhere between 60 to 90% of youth who experience child abuse do not disclose that to anyone. Um, and this is a more uh, specific local study um, here in Oregon. In this pilot from the Oregon Child Abuse Prevalence Study, um, which is, was done by the University of Oregon's uh, Center for Prevention of Abuse and Neglect, which I call CPAN, um, they did this great study of youth here in Oregon and found that 47% had never talked with anybody, anybody about their experience um, of abuse. Um, those who had shared their experience at some point in time, most often shared it with a friend or a parent or a sibling, not necessarily someone we automatically see as a mandatory reporter, such as a teacher or law enforcement, right? Uh, like the SRO in school. 
So those are some things to, to keep in mind. Um, and we know that nationally, uh, there's a lot of evidence to support too that children are not necessarily going to reporting folks. Um, and many have identified that they do not want uh, to have that report made. So I, we've got some studies in 2016 report from the National LGBTQ uh, DV Capacity Building Learning Center, which is out of Seattle, Washington. Um, they found that um, on the impact of mandatory reporting with uh, getting help and finding uh, support after domestic violence, only 48% of people under the age of 18 uh, decided that, or yeah, uh, said that they did not seek help from somebody for fear of having that report made. Um, so that reporting was something that really stopped them. Uh, it made them hesitate. And we found that this was especially true for uh, historically oppressed groups, right? So they found that for trans and gender variant folks, that number was as high as 53%. For women, 36%, um, right? So, or girls, I should say, because under the age of 18. So um, we know that also that reporting can be kind of a block for some folks. Um, sometimes it really works, does a lot of great things. And some people, it stops them from ever saying anything, right? And so I think, um, you know, again, we won't spend time too much on mandatory reporting, confidential advocacy, but seeing these as two strategies that both movements are using um, and seeing that they cover more ground, right? Um, seeing that we take up more space, we have more adults um, who are fitting in both of these circles when they're together. Um, and we're able then to reach more children and adults through these strategies, right? Providing that option. Uh, so I guess I will give like a little bit of a personal story because we wanted to add that little factor in here. Um, and so as a lot of you all who have done uh, personal, like that direct response with folks, it's kind of hard to talk about. So hang in with me. Um, in my past as a confidential advocate um, in another state long ago, uh, right? Um, we did have a, a youth that would call into our crisis line uh, frequently. Um, she identified that she was experiencing child sexual abuse at home uh, from her uh, stepdad at the time who was also involved in law enforcement. And she was calling our crisis line in particular because when she Googled it, we were the ones who came up. When she Googled who to call um, at 3 a.m., right? Like who's available to talk to 24 hours a day about this topic, she found um, the local domestic violence and sexual violence resource center that I was at at the time. Um, and so she called because what would happen at night is she would, her anxiety would rise because she was worried that he would come into her room, right? That anxiety was incredibly high. Uh, so she would call in um, certain nights and want to talk just to kind of calm herself down, do some grounding. We did a lot of that. And it was really difficult um, for her to uh, talk about what she was experiencing. And when we asked her, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to report this information? Right. Um, we don't want you to continue experiencing this violence at home. There are folks who are really qualified at talking to kids about what you're experiencing. You don't have to be alone in this process. Um, right? She experienced a lot of hesitation. Why? Why do you think that is? Um, and you could try and put it in the chat. I can also just name it. But I think for a, a bit of reflection, why would a kid in this situation really hesitate? This is a teenager. She was about uh, 15. We, uh, she kind of alluded to was about 15. Vicky, thank you. Yeah, fear of losing her family entirely, right? Why would a kid hesitate to report this information? Yeah, I, there's probably a lot of reasons coming up specifically for her. Um, and the reason I have Supergirl on this uh, slide is because we, we called her Supergirl. We never got her name. She never wanted to disclose it because even as confidential advocates, she did not trust that we wouldn't do anything with that information. Um, Y'all added some more great um, retribution, like fear of what could happen in, in return. That abusers in law enforcement, that was a huge factor for her, um, for sure. Fear of future harm, feelings of guilt. Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, she continued uh, to call into our line and we were actually uh, wanted to try and connect her with some resources that could at least give her an idea of what mandatory reporting could look like and, and going through the reporting process. Uh, so we coordinated with our child abuse or children's advocacy center in the area um, and set up a time for her to call into our 24 hour line um, when 
we had a detective sitting in the room and he anonymously, uh, you know, answered her questions, right? So she didn't give any information and he provided as much information as he could to her about what that process could look like, right? So really powerful when we were able to get together and coordinate around supporting this uh, young person, this teen, because he or she had a trusted system and a 24 hour line that she could call at any time, right? That's not necessarily true of our uh, reporting systems or, or the or folks in the child abuse world, right? Um, so she had this these people she trusted and she had these people who had some expertise around these issues. And together we were able to come and collaborate on that. So very powerful. Um, I'd like to say it ended perfectly and then she reported and then went through the whole process and the violence stopped. And unfortunately, I, I can't share that. She did not feel comfortable even after coming forward. Um, and as she aged, um, she continued to call our crisis line uh, every now and then. Um, and we continued to safety plan, um, especially with her growing independence as a teenager, right? She was able to find new ways to stay away from her stepdad to get safety, um, right? But it's, it is still very challenging. And that's why, uh, yes, there's so much benefit in coming together and so much benefit in just validating the work that both of these movements do, right? Um, so, uh, just adding a little personal uh, flavor in there for you. Uh, there are gaps, there are kids being kind of missed in the middle um, that we need to come together to uh, serve. All right, and then Eli, I think this is you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll touch on these quickly. And again, you all will have that, the PDF of these slides so you can dig in uh, deeper as we go along. Um, just thinking for our time today. And I just want to set in that one of those big pieces in those gaps is our ability and time where we get to make our partnerships and collaborate together. Um, and some of the, like the, the generalized quotes that are underneath some of these statements here are things that we've I've heard and other staff and people have like experienced in communities. Um, people wanting to actually connect more with their partners in the same community and explain why they do what they do and really have that understanding and that trust built up. Um, and when we can set that time in our movement, that's the piece that can really bring us together. And we know that uh, that's tough, easier said than done, but when we can hold that, it does a lot for us. And then especially when we get to recognize the value in different knowledge and expertise streams. Uh, so often uh, there tends to be a tendency where we're like very focused on, it's like I went to college and I did this and I have this degree. And then we also know with lived experience and all these other ways and supports and training that is out there, we have some amazing experts in our communities. And we know that some of our best experts may not have a, a, a bachelor's or a master's or whatever that may be, right? And so when we can recognize and tag up with all the training that's available and the expertise that people have we're going to have that best um that team overall to like meet the needs of people in our communities and especially when we get to address varying levels of community support um as any of us we worked in different communities we recognize when sometimes certain communities are like yeah i'll support this but i won't support that and it goes back to all these different pieces of oppression that have been built in and, and where people are coming from in terms of some of their norms that have shifted and changed so as much as possible, when we get those chances to address those varying levels of support and like communicate, educate our communities on why each other's efforts are so important and so integral and tied together, that gives us the best chance of relationship building, of connecting and helping people in, their, in our communities get that and recognize it too. Um, so and again, I want to say these are just a couple of brief ones, um, but so much of that partnering that we can do gives us a chance to help close and heal some of those gaps. Sure. Um, and as we near the end of Eli and my section here, I think it'd be really great to just um, ask you all why you find it valuable for uh, child abuse folks um, and domestic violence and sexual violence folks to partner. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to type that into the chat, but hold it for just a second. And um, I'll give you about 30 seconds to type a response. Why partner? Why? What would that do for your role? How would that change the way you do the work? What is the reason that you see it as valuable? Type that into the chat and then hold it. And then I will say go and we will all post it at the same time. Kind of be fun. I want to see what everybody thinks at the same time. The waterfall effect. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I missed I miss my joke opportunity to get my umbrella ready. It's like, here's the waterfall. I'm ready for it. Yep. Eli, you're always there with the, the good jokes, the good puns. Right. Hopefully you have something down. And I'm going to say go in three, two, one, hit it. Wow, look at them all. That actually did work really well. <laughs>
Meg suggested this to me and I was like, in all my virtual training time, I never have done this activity. And look at that, that's awesome. Uh, thank you all for posting these. There's so many good uh, reasons. Uh, and the, hopefully you can take time to read everybody else's response as well. Um, clearly there are so many people in this room seeing a reason uh, for partnering, for making collaboration between these two movements. Um, yeah, so many good things. Continuity of services and trust, more coordinated care and accessibility. Ah, oh, so wonderful. Um, I wish I could read them all out loud. So co collaboration can look so many different ways and, and we're going to now spend more time diving into what that can actually look like. I do wanna just shout out that so much uh, is already being done on the prevention and education side to better collaborate between the movements. Um, I know I'm working a lot with uh, both local and statewide level domestic violence and sexual violence partners. Um, and that's incredible. We're seeing so much happen when we're partnering. So I wanna see that in all aspects of our work. I don't wanna be the only one at my organization to do that, right? I wanna be able to send the message out to everybody. Hey, we should partner with these folks, right? Um, obviously warm referrals are so useful for the folks that we serve. I see that as a great way to partner as well. Um, and then uh, Eli's got a couple and then Aaron and Sarah will be able to talk to us about even more. Yeah, indeed. Thanks, Lindsay. And yeah, so especially, and again, you can find uh, this information here when we think about uh, SARTs and MDTs in our communities, the sexual assault response teams, child abuse multidisciplinary teams. The team is the key word here, right? These are people from multiple spaces, lenses, uh, expertise coming together to serve and partner. Um, and uh, trust is a huge piece of this, right? Like every county, will have these teams and the trust building ultimately is what makes this possible and makes this work uh, when we're bringing all these different people together. Um, and when we do see counties that are working and with a well-functioning team and all the trust has been built in, we see an increase in the number of victims coming forward. And we see uh, victims expressing, victims and survivors I'll say expressing greater satisfaction with the care that they are receiving as well. And then we can also think about co-located models. Uh, this happens and there's a large history of this across the US um, and especially uh, these co-located advocates, they may be uh, generally in like DHS um, in spaces where they can work to provide in-depth safety planning, emotional support and education and advocacy. And this really seeks um, to help make connections and engagements. So you see some of the quotes here on the screen. Uh, these are some of the benefits that survivors have experienced uh, when they get to work with a co-located advocate um, at DHS. Um, and then also uh, thinking about for DHS caseworkers themselves, some of the things they've talked about where it benefits them and their work and that ability to and what they've seen it do for their clients and people that they're working with. In co-located models, uh, there can also be advocates at schools, for example, too. And this ability where as much as they're maybe supporting populations of people, that also includes the staff at the schools and the other people who have questions and spaces to get to talk. And so these collaborations are really key and crucial. Um, and right, as Lindsay mentioned, can look a lot of different ways. And just briefly touching on, Lindsay said the word covering a lot of ground. If we think this is a hydro map of Oregon, all the rivers and streams, as tiny little inlets that are out there, when our, over, when our uh, efforts are overlapping, we're increasing the space and the needs that we can uh, help to provide for survivors, especially in their individualized experiences that they may be having. So it's like, if we just think of the main rivers in Oregon, we think of a couple, but when we really look at the tiny and the intricate streams, tributaries, there's a lot more space that we can uh, expand on and work to meet survivors' needs um, where they're at. And Lindsay, I'll let you right. finish this up. We're gonna end our section with just a quote. It's kind of long, but I think it's great. It's by Adri Adrienne Marie Brown from her book, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing, uh, Changing Worlds. It's just a really great uh, thing to read. I really encourage you to check it out. Uh, here's the quote. Do you already know that your existence, who and how you are, is in and of itself a contribution to the people and place around you? Just you being there. Uh, not after or because you do some particular thing, but simply the miracle of your life. And that the people around you and the places have contributions as well. Do you understand that the, your quality of life and your survival are tied to how, how authentic and generous the connections are between you and the people and place you live with and in. Think about also how this is tied to the life and survival of the folks we serve, right? Are you actively practicing generosity and vulnerability in order to make the connections between you and others clear, open, available, durable? Generosity here means giving of what you have 
without strings or expectations attached. And vulnerability means showing your needs. That is the quote I'll leave us on for this first app. Thanks so much, Lindsay, and for sharing those words from Adrian Marie Brown that is sustenance that's needed. And thanks again for everything that uh, in this first section here, uh, we're just kind of setting some out foundation and we're going to take a five minute break. Let's see, the time is 11.02. So we will be back at uh, 11.08 because I know that time is going to switch off just a second here. Um, and so hope you get some time to rest, relax, and uh, we will be back with you shortly and get to hear from Sarah and Aaron. Thank you all. And if you are sticking around with us here on this break, DJ Meg is going to be dropping some tunes. All right. Well, come back, everyone. All right. My screen visible. Perfect. All right. Hope you all had a good break here. And we are going to oh, take us into our welcome back now. The duck and the dog are awake. Um, and we are really excited to jump into this next section here on what partnering can look like in our communities um, in Oregon. And again, a reminder, I want to mention that this is just one example and that each community is going to have different needs and responses in place. And some of the age ranges for some of the services that are talked about today may be different in other counties and may not reflect what it's like for Douglas County. But we have just been so impressed by the partnership and the communication, the collaboration um, taking place. And so Sarah and Aaron, uh, we are really excited to hear from you all. And I will Sarah, I will pass uh, screen control to you. Thank you, Eli. Um, I'm gonna try and make sure I can click forward. <laughs> Taking a minute. To be there. There I we see. go. <laughs> All right. So um, Aaron and I are uh, here to talk about the, the kind of partnership um, Peace at Home and Douglas Cares has been able to create and foster and, and build over the years that we've been doing this work together. Um, and the the reasons that we we saw as um, as important, because we're looking in our own little tiny community, um, that we're working with the same families. Uh, one of the one of the um, research studies that I looked at, uh, and it looks similar to what Lindsay found, was that 30 to 60 percent of families um, in which there is domestic violence also have direct abuse of the children. Um, and and on on uh, also on Lindsay's slide, I'm going to draw back to that again. He said that uh, in one year we served over 118,000 adults for domestic violence. And if we're looking at 60% of those having um, children that were also abused, then that's that's 71,000 and we only served 8,000. We serve approximately 8,000 a year. So how many children are we missing when we don't effectively collaborate and, and partner on these services? Um, so so that's really what, what we're doing here. And this is 50% of batterers also abuse their children. That's um, that's right in line with that study of 30 to 60%. It's it's very common, it's in our backyard, it's it's ours. One of the things I love about working in Douglas County is that we are so small that it's easy, um, it's easy to partner. It's easy to know all the people who are players in this work and to develop personal relationships with them. There's only one DVSA. There's only one child advocacy center. Uh, you know, we're, <laughs> us partnering is a lot easier because we don't have to, you know, uh, meter out that work to lots of different agencies. It's just the two of us. Is there anything you'd like to add for that, Erin? Yeah, I'll also add that we obviously are having a lot of overlap with our sexual assault exams. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're both, you know, one or both are getting called to the hospital, depending on how old the kiddos are. If they're coming in for a sexual assault forensic exam, we're providing a lot of the same services and different services to different folks and the same folks in the community. So it just adds to the, the reason why we need to be collaborating together. And we have all of the same shared and risk factors pretty much, right? For the folks who are um, at risk of experiencing violence or the folks who are at risk of um, perpetrating violence is the same. So being able to collaborate together so that we can more effectively serve our community has been really important. 
So just, I'm sure that most folks in this room know what DVSA agencies are doing, especially in their own communities. Um, but just so we're all on the same page, most DVSA agencies, and specifically Peace at Home, we provide peer support. So, you know, we're not counselors, we're not mental health professionals um, for the most part, but we offer peer support to both parents and or the minors, um, depending on who's seeking services and what is feeling comfortable for those families. We're providing medical accompaniment, not only to sexual assault forensic exams, but also for folks who are coming into the hospital from physical injuries due to domestic violence, um, or just folks who have greater barriers in being able to access healthcare. We have specific um, health advocates that will go in and accompany folks for their medical appointments. We facilitate support groups for survivors. And also a lot of our work is systems navigation. So we've talked a lot about DHS co-located advocates, which I think is a you know key partner. We also help navigate Title IX with um, you know our K-12 systems and our and for me at Umqua Community College, as well as with law enforcement, the courts, restraining orders, things like that. So we can help folks navigate those systems um, with more ease rather than doing it by themselves. We also do a lot of Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. No, you you finish up. <laughs> I was just going to say we also do healthy relationship education and a lot of referrals and resources for um, folks that they can find mental health counseling, legal support, and things like that as well. Sorry, Erin. <laughs> uh, at the Child Advocacy Center, um, again, a lot of you probably know this, uh, we have a very specific niche in this, um, in this world. Uh, we want to be the hub of the, the child abuse investigation. So we want the child to come to us and then all the other partners who work um, in that investigation in investigation and response to come here to see the children all in one all in one place so that they don't have to do multiple different appointments, multiple engagements with with the different bodies because all that can be really frightening and and um, and difficult to navigate. So on our premises, we do forensic medical exams. Um, which can be a challenging uh, experience for a child. Uh, a lot of times they have to take all their clothes off. They always have to take some of their clothes off um, and be photographed. Uh, we, in that space, we we always have a chaperone in there and we really love it when that chaperone is a confidential advocate from Peace at Home, if that's the appropriate person to be in there. We also do forensic interviews. Um, that's where it's a recorded interview where a child tells the whole story about what happened to them. Um, and it meets the evidentiary standard to be played in a court of law and, and used as evidence against the perpetrator. Um, we do family advocacy. So that includes um, a lot of the referrals that Aaron mentioned, legal referrals, housing, um, whatever resources the family might need in that moment. And when we say family, we mean the children and the non-offending caregivers. Uh, CACs have have kind of a prohibition against working with working directly with um, the person who who uh, perpetrated the harm against the child. However, uh, a lot of us are realizing that um, that in that area, sometimes it makes sense to to bring that family member in as well if they're going to continue to be a part of the family if the abuse wasn't really. Um, uh, serious to the point that that those bonds can't be healed. Uh, and our family advocate uh, can go into the courtroom with the family and and sit through the the process in there, um, comfort the child, take them on breaks, and, and be there as a support through that whole piece of the, the pie. Um, and then our CAC, and a lot of the CACs in Oregon, but not all of them yet, um, also offer trauma-focused therapy. Uh, so when the child and family have gone through that pretty traumatic experience of the investigation and also the trauma of whatever led to the investigation, um, they're then referred to the other side of our agency and we are able to provide comprehensive case management that kind of pulls from family advocacy and, and then takes it on, on to the next stage into the long-term um, skills training, which is which is unique to um, our CAC, that a skills trainer is a bachelor credentialed person who works under the direction of the therapist and kind of extends the um, the lessons of, from the therapy office out into the real world. They work with families and children in their communities at home, at school, at the park, wherever the family finds themselves needing to, to practice the skills that they're learning in therapy, um, the, the skills trainer can go with them on that and help kind of coach in real time. Um, 
we're uh, also in the next couple of months going to be providing groups for both teenagers and um, for parents who are um, who are in this process of, of healing from from abuse and traumatic experiences. Uh, so those groups can be uh, really, really beneficial because people can talk with with others who've experienced the same thing and who are going through the same thing. And um, and it's not all like the clinician to the to the client kind of perspective. It's it's more of a group experience where where there's more camaraderie and more more understanding that's taking place between the two people. So I think we all um, have probably heard about confidentiality, obviously, with advocates. And a lot of times we have a negative reaction, I think, when we're working with community partners, especially like particularly like with schools, um, that can be a challenge uh, coming in and saying, I'm confidential and I'm here to support children and parents. Um, and so I wanted to highlight some of the benefits that we see for having confidentiality for minors and and Lindsay did a really good job at explaining a really awesome story about how that was supportive in the in, in um in his experience but I always like to highlight that we are able to have a a full conversation to have to offer more comprehensive and individualized safety planning that you might not be able to have if you're in the room with a mandatory reporter and this child or the teenager is not wanting to make a report. So they're going to be watching what they're saying, right? And it's the same thing for parents and, and adults as well. If they have children, they're not going to be as fully honest or fully transparent with what's going on if they're worried about making a report. We also are building rapport and trust building with healthy and supportive adults that I think is a really great example that we can kind of lead for the youth in our communities when they, you know, obviously if they're seeking services, they probably have unhealthy adults in their life um, or have experienced abuse from adults. So being able to be an example of how adults can set boundaries with folks and be healthy and supportive so they have a place to go, you know, if and when they're struggling. We're also able to make reports just because we're confidential and we're not mandated to make a report doesn't mean we can't make a report with a child. Um, and also, I think just students have the right <laughs> to a confidential advocate, which is super important. I'll tell a story about um, a student that I worked with a couple years ago. We were doing healthy relationship education in a classroom and we had a student come up to us at the end of the class. And lucky for us, the teachers were very open for us to be able to meet with students privately. So myself and another advocate were meeting with the student and they expressed this experience that they had where an older adult was, you know, effectively grooming them over um, text and in person and things like that. And there was just a lot of, you know, as we all know, a lot of complicated feelings that come with that, the, you know, they trusted this person, they liked this person, but also there was this, you know, huge age gap that's really inappropriate and just the potential for harm is really there and so we were able to talk through this with the student on just like well what does it look like to talk with this person what does it not look to not like to talk with this person how can we make sure that you're staying safe um and are also processing these really weird and complicated emotions in a safe space so we were able to talk through that um and make sure that the, the student was safe um and the student was okay and be able to just be that that support person for them. They probably wouldn't have had that conversation with a teacher or a counselor just because they knew it would have been a report for a, an adult they didn't want to have a report made on. Um, so they were able to access those services in that moment. And I know that um, Eli brought this slide up and uh, I love this slide so much I wanted to go to bring it back and to talk a little bit more deeply about about each of these um, types of abuse, uh, each of these different um, categories that are often um, overlapping, but often they happen to the same person in the same setting. Uh, so these are kind of divided out by age group, right? We've got child abuse neglect is obviously under 18, um, or and it kind of pushes over a little bit when we're talking about um, kind of disabled young adults um, who who still have the mentality of a child, it's the same kind of exploitation. Um, sexual assault kind of starts, it looks like a, around um, 12 to 18. Um, it's, we, we work with infants 
Um, we do exams on, on babies, sometimes a few days to a month old, um, because someone hurt them sexually. Uh, so it just falls under the category of child abuse when it's somebody who's prepubescent, um, but it's, but it is also sexual assault. Dating violence can happen, um, from, from young childhood on, uh, we're also seeing a big increase in peer-to-peer -peer and interpersonal violence, um, I, I look at the numbers for our local schools and uh, I, ca I can see, I can run numbers from, from year to year, peer-to-peer -peer violence, especially peer-to-peer -peer sexual violence, even if it's not, um, you know, in the, within the context of a relationship uh, is, is increasing in our little community. And um, it's it, just in one year um, I received a, uh, over a hundred reports out of one of our two middle schools here for peer-to-peer -peer violence of some nature. And that includes bias and hate crime related um, incidents. Uh, there's a boy in, uh, we, we received a case from one of our local schools, which was really, really quite disheartening um, because of the, the, the school's response to it uh, of a boy on a football team who, who, uh, for all intents and purposes, fits in with the crowd. He's uh, he was very much a member of the football team. Um, the other boys on the football team held him down and annually penetrated him with their fingers and with other implements, and um, they called that hazing. Like that's that's what they do to kind of initiate this relationship on the team. And and the the part that was very disheartening was that the the principal of the school made the report. But the child's father, who was also the assistant coach, um, would not uh, would not follow through with with that. So ended up being no victim, no crime, can't move forward. Um, but but peer to peer and interpersonal violence is is becoming a, a very large issue in our community. And I saw um, someone in the chat speak up saying that that's happening in their communities as well. Um, we also work very closely with our human trafficking task force, uh, and Peace at Home has um, has does a lot of work with with human trafficking victims. Uh, so, so that's a that's another layer of the partnerships that we're able to provide here. And a little bit later, uh, I have a a pretty compelling story that touches all three of us in um, in that area. But as you can see, the the nature of this slide is is just talking about how how much overlap this is these are really the same people um and it have it often happens multiple times in a single person's lifespan they start in a situation with child abuse neglect end up in sexual violence end up in dating violence um and then follow through all the way into um interpersonal intimate partner violence when they're adults in um in committed relationships um, there's there is no place where you can draw a line and say this is only happening at this time in the age span. It's it's all of it all the time. I think we want to go back a slide, Sarah. You're right. Sorry. <laughs> um, but now we're going to read a vignette of a made up story. There we are. Um, about a student making a disclosure. So I'm just going to go ahead and read the slide. A 13-year-old student, Jessica, is talking to her teacher one-on-one -on -one after school about her math assignment. Usually, Jessica does well in math, but she recently failed. The teacher asks Jessica if her parents help with her homework at home. Jessica responds, not last night. Dad and I watched a movie under a blanket on the couch. Jessica looks down on the floor as she is talking and avoids eye contact. The teacher repeats, do you often watch movies under a blanket with your dad? And Jessica responds quickly, saying it isn't a big deal and nothing happens, it's normal. Her teacher reflects, I hear that this is normal to watch movies with your dad and you aren't in any trouble. It's okay to talk with me. Does watching movies under the blanket ever make you feel uncomfortable? Yeah, when he touches me down there. He touches you, the teacher asks kindly. No, nothing happens. Okay, I hear you saying nothing happens. I see it's hard for you to talk about this and that's okay. You aren't in any trouble. Very carefully, the teacher continues. I have to let somebody know about what you told me and some people might wanna to talk to you. It's okay, you aren't in any trouble. Your job is to just tell them the truth. Everything's gonna be okay and, and I'm here for you. 
The teacher then lets the student know there are people who want to support her. There are confidential advocates you can talk to and they can support you. Is it okay if I call one for you? The teacher then connects Jessica to a peace at home advocate and makes a child abuse report to DHS. Now what? So um, I will talk about kind of what happens when a teacher or a member at a school calls peace at home. Um, we've worked in the last several years to partner with schools to let them know that we are a resource for them. Um, and that's obviously, you know, in process, right? It's always building those relationships. We have how many schools in every district, right? But what that would look like is typically I or a sexual assault um, advocate would respond to the school and we would ask if we were able to talk with the student privately. Um, we obviously would ask that it would be in like a room with like window doors, things like that to, you know, with child safety and things like that. Um, but be able to speak with the child without um, the mandatory reporter there just so they have opportunity to really, again, have that comprehensive safety planning conversation with us. Um, with a student like what Jessica would say, I most likely would have been talking to the teacher first. Um, the teacher probably would don't tell me what happened. Um, I would talk to them, let them know that I'm gonna go talk to the student. Um, and I, at that point, would also reiterate what my confidentiality looks like. And that is just so that teachers and staff and other folks in the, in the school aren't then coming to me later being like, so can you tell me everything that you talked about Jessica with? Um, because I will just not be able to tell them. Um, so then I would talk to Jessica. We would safety plan about home, how things are going to look, and also reiterating that the teacher is going to make a report and that um, peace at home advocates are there to support her throughout the whole process with DHS. We would kind of explain what that is gonna look like, that maybe some people are gonna come talk to her um, and that she can have an advocate there to support her and she can call us anytime. Um, so it's kind of the, the gist of what that would look like. And we typically would also be following up on um, support services afterwards to make sure she's connected to counseling, things like that, whatever would be helpful for her. We also would look and see if a sexual assault forensic exam is appropriate um, and if that's something that she would want to engage in and then talk through that process as well. And for those of you on the call who are mandatory reporters, you you know this process and the rules governing um, this process and that hold specifically to you very well. There are others on the call who maybe have never made a mandatory report and don't know um, how that works or how they fit into the process. So I will describe a little bit of that. Um, number one, the person who heard the information is the one who has to make that call. Uh, and and I've and I've worked with a lot of people. Like I continually um, educate my own community in this. Uh, some agencies have that go to the supervisor, and the supervisor makes the call. But according to Oregon law, the person who heard the information, who who um, heard or witnessed the incident happening is the one who has to make that report. And that doesn't mean go talk to your, don't go talk to your supervisor and figure out, you know, what the company does, you know, share ideas, talk about whether or not this is actually reportable. Absolutely do that. But the person who heard the information needs to make the, the report. So this teacher in this situation might talk with her um, supervisor at, about what happened and um, the fact that she needs to make this call um, and what kinds of things she already knows. What she knows now is all she can report. It is not her job to ask any more questions of this child. She's not supposed to do an investigation. She's supposed to, um, as much information as she has without without um, asking any additional questions, aside from, do you feel safe? The teacher can always ask that question. And that's a really important thing to, to know um, so that you can problem solve that issue immediately. But otherwise, the teacher's job is to talk. The teacher will have access to to the um, really important things about the case that that some of us otherwise won't. They'll know the the child's name, date of birth, address, parents' names, phone numbers, all these things that are really really helpful when you're making a child abuse report. Sometimes community members don't have access to all that stuff, but they still have to make a report. So. Um, if the teacher has a really good relationship with the um, confidential advocate and, and has made that call, um, they they have you know they have the ability to have the advocate come into the room. Um, I have found in my work, um, both as a as a leader now and before when I did direct service, it is incredibly powerful to um, 
to have the person who was harmed or even the person who caused the harm sit next to you and make that report or make the report while you're there. Um, that can discharge your duties as a mandated reporter as long as you let them know you're in the room, you, you heard this, um, you're part of that. But to have that person make the report themselves is incredibly empowering. Um, and that's where the advocate can come in and, and help um, support the youth victim who who um, who wants to make the report themselves, uh, and um, or you know if if there's an adult involved and the adult is the one who who caused the harm. Um, I used to work with a family who um, who mom lost her children to child welfare due to to drug offenses. This was before those laws passed, and everything is um, is a lot more generous uh, and a lot more likely to do problem solving rather than immediate removal. So it was a while ago. Um, but I was working with a family after the after they had been reunited uh, and mom admitted to me that that she had slipped and used again. Uh, and we had a good enough relationship that I was able to encourage her to call her caseworker and make that report herself. And then I drove her over to the substance use walk in clinic immediately after because she was the one who, who made that report and because she took immediate actions to resolve the issue, the children were not removed again. Um, so when we empower people uh, to understand the ramifications of what's happened and and to be part of the process in um, in resolving the problem, they're much less likely to to impact some of those those really traumatic experiences that happen when child welfare gets involved. And that's um, that's one of the most beneficial pieces of the relationship that Peace at Home and Douglas Cares has is that empowerment of the families and uh, the minimized damage that can be a result of, um, of these incidences. Um, I think Aaron was gonna talk a little bit about who can be in the room when making a report, if there's, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. I, um, as an advocate can absolutely be in the room while making the report along with the mandatory reporter with the student. And that would be an option that would be presented when having that initial conversation with the student is sounds like your teacher is going to make a report. Um, this is what this would look like. And if you would like, we can go sit in the room together. And so you can know, you know, what's going on. You can know, um, how your story is being told. You can talk to the person directly if you'd like, or you can let the teacher do the talking. It's giving, again, giving back some of those choices back to the student. Um, and we can also be in the room when there's additional follow-up as well with caseworkers and things like that. We just kind of need to know ahead of time and stay in contact with students. And we can have releases of information written with the student so that, um, we can then have that additional collaboration with folks like Douglas Cares, folks like DHS, the teachers, whatever that looks like for the student that would be the most supportive for them. Um, so we'd absolutely be in the room and that would really just look like us sitting there and being in the room with them. Um, it's not, I opt to not, I'm not speaking for the student. I'm not doing anything for the student. Um, sometimes I've had incidences where will kind of essentially safety plan for the report before we go into the room. So sometimes, especially with younger folks, they're maybe not, they're really nervous. It's, you know, it's really upsetting. And so saying like, hey, we can pause at any point. You can just like, look at me. You can like tap my arm or whatever that looks like. And I will happily say, we need to take a break and I will do that for you. Um, and we can step out. So that's kind of what some of the additional, like really just emotional support pieces that an advocate can do while making a report with somebody. Uh, I just got a message in the chat that I wanted to touch. Is ODHS Child Welfare willing to meet and interview children at CARES um, with an advocate present? Um, and uh, child welfare always meets at CARES. Uh, that's, we, we see them, we see them for every case here. Uh, and they don't have any um, concerns with, uh, with a peace at home advocate being there. Um, so the interview can take place at CARES. It um, it often doesn't. Um, it often happens at um, the school or at the home of the family, uh, but it can happen here and, and we're happy to support that. Um, so when they come, it's it's usually after 
child welfare's initial contact with the family. And I'll add to that as well. Um, since Peace at Home has a DHS co-located advocate that's specifically within child welfare, if a caseworker has already identified that domestic violence is also a piece of that, what's going on with that family, um, and also potentially depending on kind of what the situation is with the student or the, the minor, um, DHS will just bring an advocate with them to go to the home to, to talk to the family. And so, and they just, and that, and so the advocate is able to be there and support mom or kiddo or whatever that looks like for that family. So this is kind of um, a, a long-term look at what happens when child abuse is reported. Um, so we talked a lot about the disclosure and the report, then advocacy can come in. Advoc advocacy can come in at any stage in this process. The advocate is sometimes the one that the report is made to, um, that the original disclosure is made to. And then our um, wonderful partners at child welfare and law enforcement come in and they do the investigation. That's that's where their role is. They they interview all the parties involved. They look for ev they they take the evidence that we generate um, at Douglas Cares uh, because we don't make determinations about child abuse. We just generate evidence, and um, and our providers can give a professional opinion as especially our medical providers as to whether um, the injury witnessed could be um, accidental harm or if it's definitely, or it's most likely non-accidental. Uh, so we give a professional opinion, but we are not the ones who make the decision about um, whether or not it's founded as child abuse, whether or not there's a criminal case involved, or whether or not there, um, what, what actions need to be taken afterward, such as child removal. So our job is to be a partner to the family, to to um, generate the evidence for our other partners to take and then um, and then use to make determinations in the case. Uh, in the court system, that's where the judge um, is is involved and will um, child welfare or the law enforcement will will present their case, whether that's criminal or um, or custodial. So uh, child welfare has to go to court and and present the case as to why they think they need to take custody of a child. Um, and then the judge makes that ruling that yes, this is is necessary in this case. Um, that's not to say that they're not allowed to take immediate actions to protect children. They are able to take immediate action if they if a judge isn't available to put children into safety, and then um, very soon after they have to go and present their case for the judge for an actual ruling. Um, and then the long term care. Uh, Douglas Cares does a lot of that, but um, you'll notice the stripe across the bottom is school support. Um, because school support is there um, before anyone ever heard about a disclosure, and after everything is said and done, and the chat and the family has healed from the from the experience, um, they they are very unique in this entire process um, because they have to tr see every child. Um, it, more than any of the rest of us, we a lot of us are voluntary services or, or court mandated services, but schools are required to see every child in the community, and and they have this very important role. So when we're talking about partnering, we also have to make sure that we're we're have good relationships with our schools and that they know they can count on us when they need us, um, and that that we have open lines of communication. Yeah, and I think an advocacy at Sarasite can be at any point in this as well. Um, I also add that a lot of times when we're working with families, um, we'll have an advocate that's kind of assigned uh, to the parent and to the child. And those are usually two different advocates just because confidentiality and things like that, if there's not releases, all of those, you know, fun components. Um, and it just, it offers, you know, mom or parents a place to talk about how stressful and scary that is. Um, regardless of whether or not they are experiencing direct harm, like if domestic violence is part of the, the, the situation or not, um, they can still get that support. Um, and so that's really, especially when we're doing sexual assault forensic exams and parents are there to support kiddo, um, we can have an advocate there to, to support the parents as well. So a lot of the just overall arching goals that we both have is that 
you know, best case scenario, if we can have an advocate and the child present when making the report, we have more youth empowerment, as Sarah was saying, and we're just otherwise engaging the youth and family in making the report. So whether or not they are in the room or they're not, or whatever feels best for them, if, if we're giving them options and choices so that they can have that more empowerment part of the process. We know that in reality, mandatory reporters have to make the reports as soon as possible. So sometimes it's not always, you know, it's not always possible that an advocate and a child can be in the room while making the report, especially if, um, you know, maybe someone is just immediately making the report and not thinking about bringing in advocates or children into the op into the room to make the report. So that's where the relationships with key youth serving organizations and schools come in so that we can let them know what best practices look like, let them know that we're here to provide those services for them. Um, and I also, I'll share that like one time I had a, an high school call me to come talk to a student who had experienced physical child abuse from their parent. And so the teacher, or actually in this case, it was like a, a counselor of sorts, um, had let me know they were going to make a report, but they wanted to have the teenager have some time to talk to me and kind of off offer some choices there. In that conversation with the student, I was able to find out that DHS was already involved with the student. Um, and so there's already that relationship of some sorts with the case um, caseworker at DHS. So we were able to work together between DHS, the school, and the student to offer, you know, one, get a release for the, the school. So I can say, hey, the student does actually want to re-engage with DHS. This is the caseworker they've already had. So if you, you know, you can call the child abuse hotline as well and fulfill your duties, um, as well as here is that the direct caseworker that's already a part of the prop, like a part of the family. I'm so sorry. Words are so hard this morning. Um, and so maybe we can make a report also specifically to that caseworker since the child is already familiar with them and more comfortable with them. Um, and so ultimately we were able to make sure the student had some say, even though they opted out of being in the room with the mandatory report. Thanks. Um, I was going to share a story also, um, but I just got the 10 minute warning, so I'm going to skip it. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about uh, one of the other um things we were able to do in our community that was beyond just the DBSA and CAC uh, collaboration. So as many of you know, um, there uh, there's also a court appointed advocate with the DA's office for, for victim services. Uh, so, so there are multiple groups that might interact with a family at any um, stage of this process. And um, in our little community, our DBSA had, uh, had created a task force on family against family violence, uh, with the goal of um, preserving the lives of women of victims of domestic violence. Because during during the course of events, um, they they realized how common it was for women to die at the hands of their intimate partners um, when there was violence involved. So they created this task force on family violence that included. Um, uh, the DA's office, law enforcement, the court system, the judges, um, our child advocacy center, because we're often um, involved in in the same cases, um, and some and Cow Creek, and multiple different law enforcement. Uh, Cow Creek is our it's our tribe, our local tribe, um, who provide their own advocates for for families uh, and victims of violence. Um, so recently, within the last year. The CAC, due to some grant funding shifting around, took over coordination of the task force on family violence. And we feel like that's part of our mission because family violence affects adult women as well as children. And when we can impact this, this very important mission of preserving the lives of women, we preserve the lives of mothers of children. And um, and we look uh, across the spectrum at, preserv at uh, prevention more than anything else. And so we prevent violence against women. We often prevent violence against children as well. So the Child Advocacy Center now um, coordinates that group. And it also includes the Human Trafficking Task Force. Um, so the CAC uh, provides advocates um, for children zero to 18 with child abuse and neglect investigations, 
Peace at Home provides confidential advocates for um, for older children. Uh, I, I think their cutoff is like 11 or 12 uh, on the young side um, and, and throughout the lifespan. So uh, of intimate partner or sexual violence. Um, there's a court advocate who who takes care of children and families during the process of the court prep and proceedings. And there's a Cow Creek um, advocate who takes care of victims of crime if they're tribal members. Um, and for all of these, we wanted to make sure that number one, every family or child or person, individual who needed an advocate would have one. And number two, that as we shifted from one advocate to another, that we didn't um, we didn't lose track of the process, that nobody fell through the gap, through the cracks. So we created an MOU with all of these um, organizations that provide advocacy, whether confidential or not, and um, and lined out our our stage in, in the process and how we share information, what um, what limits of confidentiality they are, what kind of releases have to be signed and how we shift families from one of us to the other without losing anything in the way. So very proud of, of that work that we were able to do here and the benefit to families. Um, Aaron and I also wanted to talk about uh, sexual assault um, and forensic exams and how how that process works in Douglas County. It is, it is different here than it is um, particularly in um, at CARES Northwest uh, in Portland. There are lots of people who can respond to things like this. In, in Roseburg, there are two um, uh, one's a nurse and one's a nurse practitioner who respond to adult victims of sexual violence. And there are two nurse practitioners who work at the CAC who respond to children victims of sexual violence. So, um, so that's it. That's, we're on call 24 hours a day. The four of them are on call 24 hours a day. Um, they can kind of coordinate vacation time so that we don't have gaps in coverage, but we definitely have gaps in coverage. Um, so, uh, the the adult sane nurses who do the exams can see uh they're legally allowed to see children as young as 15. um are, locally they typically cap it at 16 and they call us in um for any for anybody younger than 16. um, um but but also it's kind of it's kind of a toss-up we want to see everyone under 18 and even young adults um who who have some special needs uh, because we have a much more comfortable setting. You can see uh, our our clinic in the photographs here. We um, we use real sheets. We use a beautiful handmade quilt as a cover up. It's 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 not in a busy emergency room with with all the noises and just curtains separating you from other people. We want we want our vulnerable people to be in in our clinic because it's quiet. It's intimate. You're the only person there receiving care, um, and that's our preference. But sometimes you know the for whatever reason the needs don't don't work out that way um so often between the ages of 16 and 18 um we work with peace at home um and sometimes they're the first people who are called when there's a sexual assault that re reports to the hospital and i'll let aaron talk about what happens then absolutely so uh when that happens we have you know really a young adult at that time uh who is there specifically to have a sexual assault forensic exam, Mercy, our local hospital will typically call peace at home and a confidential advocate will respond. Um, they'll provide options, explain what this kit is going to look like, things like that. And kind of depending on where they're at in the process, once we get there, we'll offer them to go to Douglas Cares um, because we we know it's going to be more comfy, right? Um, but if we're there and the stain's already there and things like that, it might not be the best the best option. Um, I'll share that recently we had a response where it was a, an older teenager who was there to get an exam and there was no adult sane to respond. And the family had already been there for hours by the time that the advocate got there because there was a delay in calling peace at home. And so the advocate was able to let them know like, hey, we can call CARES and we can go over to CARES and we can get this process going a lot more quicker, a lot more friendly environment. Um, and that's what they opted to do. So Peace at Home was able to um, hang out with the parent while kiddo was in with one of CARES advocates and with their SANE nurse. And they were able to get the kit going and support was there for everyone who was there as part of the family. And that just was you know, obviously a much better option. And that was in the middle of the night as well. 
um, than sitting and waiting for potentially hours more in our emergency room waiting for an adult sane. Um, some of the challenges that have been expressed to us, like we just do this because we're a small town and we we see things and we get to change them right away. But some of the challenges that we um, have heard expressed over over this collaboration um, is the, the, the myths around confidentiality. Um, so a lot of uh, CACs, my my friends and partners and and us before, you know, we were able to make this connection um, were had concerns around the the privileged piece of, of that advocacy. Um, but I wanted to, it's, it's become very clear to me and to our partners in through our partnership that, that not being able to report abuse doesn't mean that they condone abuse. Um, it, they, they are very much involved with the family. If they see there's a safety risk, they're right there, their safety planning, their, um, they're hearing the whole story where we can't always hear the whole story because of that fear of the mandated reporting or or the the law enforcement or, or other repercussions of sharing that story. Peace at Home gets to hear the whole story and they get to work in real time with the family on the, the actual challenges they're seeing. Um, but so so there's this this overlap and this benefit of both of us being involved or sometimes just peace at home being involved. Lindsay talked about that child that never reported, but how much comfort and and control she felt over her life because she had that ability to talk to somebody about it whenever she needed to. Um, it's not the ideal situation, but it's the best she could have hoped for. And we weren't, we didn't just leave her alone in that situation. Um, another another thought that's that's come up is is where um what well, is the division of duties. Uh, where peace, kid, child, the child advocacy center has their own advocates. Um, when peace at home advocate is there, which advocate does what? Um, and that's that's just a conversation to be had. You know, um, we can lay out the parameters of of who's there um, to guide the process through which stage, and and that's something that we were able to do in uh, Douglas County. Another piece um, that is for those of us who bill for services. Uh, that could be a concern is the idea that we're double billing for the same family. It's not a concern here, and I and I believe that's true of most DBSAs, but I'm not certain of that. Um, we we bill insurance companies um, for a fee on a fee for service model for each of the services that we provide. But Peace at Home is 100% grant funded, so there's never any um, overlap or correlation between us serving the same family in the same setting, you know, on the same day or any of those challenges that two billing organizations would have to face. So that it, there's there's really a many fewer barriers than there are um, benefits. Absolutely, I think we have come up to the five minute mark. So <laughs> that is all we have to say. <laughs> yes. So thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor to work with our um, DVSA here locally. And uh, we look forward to much more comprehensive partnering. And uh, we would love to be the model for the rest of the state. Um, happy always to answer questions, to provide coaching. Um, uh, our, we had, <clears throat> there'll be some contact questions at the end of the email, um, but we really appreciate all of you being here. Yes, thank and you. I will, and I will hand control back to Eli. <laughs> Sarah and Aaron, thank you so much for sharing that, and especially the way that you spoke to when we're finding these spaces to actually connect someone. And to have this, you know, recognition and this ability for someone not to be alone and that sharing, and especially Lindsay, you made the mention earlier on around the weight that so often so many of our organizations we are doing all this because of you know the care and like what we're hoping to like support our communities with. And it's like those weights alone are so much to carry. And so when we can share, when we can shift, when we can connect with others, that opportunity to like have those further streams that are individualized to every survivor's unique needs, while there may be similar types of violence, every person will be totally different. So that's a huge, huge aspect of the combination collaboration. And I really appreciate you both sharing those, some of that partnership and what that's looked like. And uh, and I can imagine too the amount of time for building that partnership too, right? Like it, it takes time, it takes moments. And so as we come back and wind down here with our last couple moments, 
uh, today. I apologize if there's something that popped up in the chat. I can't see chat. So if there is, say, hey, y'all, let me know if there's something I need that uh, needs to be brought up. But just coming back in and tying in with these shared goals again, uh, where all kids and adults have access to safety, health, and wellness, where we can fill the gaps in our current system that is responding to violence, and then also serving our communities in the best way possible, which means connecting through with other service providers, even through those differences, like you named Sarah, like, you know, sometimes it's like these differences that may pop up are actually a lot less than our similarities and our overlaps, um, which is really key. And we hope, again, this is just a small piece of the puzzle. There are so many conversations, uh, lenses, perspectives, voices that are also adding and informing these conversations going forward, right? So we're excited for that work to come. But as we you know, go up into our own communities, we can be thinking where are those opportunities that we can set to actually get to know and partner with uh, folks that we work with outside of large meetings, right? It's one thing to come together in a big space, but when we can get that time for coffee or just to like, you know, learn more about the people we're working with, that strengthens our relationships and our organizations. Where are those aspects where we can uh, share and boost each other's efforts, collaborate? Uh, for example, April is Sexual Assault Action Month and Child Abuse Prevention Month. Where are those overlapping efforts that we can show our community how we're united and work together? And then as well, any resources uh, to keep and continue exploring in these conversations. Um, and so with that, just sending a reminder again uh, for the partnership guide um, to always refer back to. And again, this is version one, you see, there will be at some point in the future, there's gonna be shifts, things get added. But for now, uh, this is uh, something that uh, we're really excited about for helping to support people. And then also I uh, wanted to bring up to the OHA Rape Prevention and Education resource map, resource map. Um, Meg, thanks so much for dropping that in the chat. This is an amazing tool that gets uh, a space for us to look at Oregon um, into a county level, a multiple lenses around uh, violence, harm, and abuse and neglect, and also ways for like prevention and other pieces too. So there's some great data there. And then again, next week, uh, webinar two, mandatory reporting and confidential advocacy partnerships in youth serving settings. Uh, we're really excited for our presenters that are gonna be there with us then too few citations and just wanted to give a big thank you uh, to everyone uh, for joining us today, the work that you're doing in our communities and uh, to our presenters. Uh, thank you so much for your time and expertise. Uh, and if you have any further follow-up questions, uh, please reach out to us at taskforce at Oregon SATF and we can do any connecting emails from there also. So thank you all and take care.